Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, our dear doctors and friends. A biobalanced evening to you all. To formally open this program and to give us a brief introduction on our lecture and speaker for tonight, he has a European double board certification in anti-aging medicine and nutritional medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, let us call on stage the Chief Science Officer and Medical Director of Biobalance Institute, Dr. Theodore Ted B. Achacoso. Good evening. As some of you know, I am only here in this country for 30 days every quarter or four times a year. So what all of you don't know is that while outside the country, I have actually been diagnosed with a rare condition and I'd like to share it with you tonight. I have been diagnosed with a case of reverse paranoia. Uh, I am constantly suspecting that people are constantly plotting to make me happy. Your presence here tonight makes me happy, so thank you very much for clinching my diagnosis. Welcome to the first lecture of 2016 of the Health Optimization Medicine Lecture Series for Continuing Basic Medical Education. Now, we all know what Continuing Medical Education is, or CME. Um, it is an update of clinical information for illness medicine specialties. And for some of you, an opportunity to exercise because I heard that CMEs are actually a good place to go to play some golf. Now, Continuing Basic Medical Education is what I have conceptualized. And what is it? Continuing basic medical education is a refresher of basic medical information that we have probably forgotten that forms the basis of our clinical practice. For example, I woke up, Washington DC is my home city, and I woke up with this headline from the Washington Post in one of the articles. The latest study about antioxidants is terrifying. Scientists think they may boost cancer cells to spread faster. Well, holy cannoli, right? I don't need to have an Italian expletive. Um, th today, my inbox will be full of, of my patients who are on antioxidant therapy. In that same month, the Scientific American published this article, Antioxidants May Make Cancer Worse. So how do I go about and reach into my basic science in order to be able to answer my cancer patients on antioxidant therapy? This is what I was reading, a very boring subject, oxidative stress and oxidative uh, damage in carcinogenesis, <clears throat> which, of course, is saying the opposite. So what is oxidative stress in anyway? What's oxidation? Um, you know, um, the simplest way of thinking about oxidation is rusting in terms of your iron, right? Or when you peel open a banana and leave it in the air for a while, it's going to turn brown. But What's the role of oxygen? Why the hell do we have to breathe? Why do you beat your residents to pulp when they do not rise, raise the arterial uh, PO2 or they do not raise the hemoglobin high enough for oxygenation? That's because oxygen is the, ready for this, it is the final electron acceptor in complex four of the electron transport chain during oxidative phosphorylation in the production of ATP. And that is the reason why we all breathe. The red bombs that are in there um, are, show where exactly where ROS production occurs, or the re reactive oxygen species. And in particular, complex one and three produce ROS in the inner mitochondrial matrix that is neutralized by manganese superoxide dismutase and complex 3 produces ROS in the intermembrane space of the mitochondria uh, that is neutralized by zinc copper superoxide dismutase. I see your face is going well. Why do I need to know that? Well because if it's ever occurred to you that we can now measure intracellular zinc, intracellular copper and intracellular manganese not the serum kind that will not give you any idea of the function of your mitochondria. Now, we also know from basic science that redox signaling is actually used as a low-level communication between the mitochondria and your cellular nucleus. 
um, it is actually used by the body in what's called respiratory burst in, resp in, in inflammation where high levels of ROS are used to kill bacteria and viruses. In fact, the hydroxyl free radical, for example, appears in a few femtoseconds just to kill your viruses. It's also accumulation of ROS that can help you kill cancer cells. Now, too much of ROS can cause mitochondrial dysfunction, and of course, when cytochrome C pops out of the mitochondrion, it signals apoptosis to the cell and causes disease and aging. So, a simple way of uh, looking at this is that of balance. ROS at proper levels will cause stem cell renewal, proliferation and differentiation, healthy immune responses and longevity. And too much or too little will cause stem cell exhaustion, tumorigenesis, autoimmunity, and senescence. Can we measure oxidative stress? Yes, we can. In this country, in fact, we can. Take a look at this. 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine is the rusting of your DNA, and it's a marker, actually, for a risk factor for cancer, atherosclerosis, and diabetics, and appears earlier than other risk markers that you can have. Now, lipid peroxidation is, uh, of course, the um, oxidation or rusting of your cell membranes, and you can actually use it to monitor the responses of your patients who are on antioxidant therapy in patients with ovarian cancer. And of course, the basic intracellular um, redox buffer is glutathione, which is distributed in three compartments, if you remember from basic biochemistry, is in the cytoplasm, the nucleus, and the mitochondria. And you could actually target to raise intracellular glutathione in order to augment your treatment for resistant ovarian cancer. Now, continuing basic medical education is an update of basic medical information from where we graduated from medical school. Now, this just appeared last week, March 2, 2016, a newsletter that's being pumped out to all of the patients of uh, Stanford University. Vitamin D deficiency contributes to the spread of breast cancer in mice, and that vitamin D suppresses the expression of a gene known to accelerate the growth of breast cancer. And why is this? We need to update our uh, information from medical school. This is what they learned, the classic endocrine pathway. We all know that um, vitamin D is hydroxylated in the liver and then activated in the kidneys. That's why the nephrologists were happy to have this in their camp for a while. And then it then uh, causes the cascade of your calcium metabolism. But now we have discovered to update our information that vitamin D actually has an autocrine paracrine pathway and is activated in virtually all cells of the body to activate about 2,000 genes and that's why it's possible to, uh, for it to exert epigenetic signaling, induction of apoptosis and decrease tumor induced angiogenesis. Now if we did not upgrade or update our information on vitamin D, we would be stuck with treating rickets and keeping the values at 20 nanograms per ml. However, we do know that around 32 nanograms ml or more, then it prevents cancers like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, kidney cancer, and endometrial cancer. You don't need to rush to the um, uh, lab anymore to get one. It's as simple as a pregnancy test. You prick the finger with a drop, uh, and then 10 minutes later, two lines and you're pregnant, rather you're D deficient and the cutoff is 32 nanograms per ml. Now CBME is an update of basic medical information from when we graduated from medical school. Now what do we need to upgrade? This is what woke me up in, September, in, in uh, November of 2015 in the Atlantic, which of course my patients were also reading. And of course you would expect a barrage of questions for you. The hottest new cancer drugs depend on gut microbes. In particular, this is a, these are studies on immunotherapy. Three studies were reviewed here. And in particular, uh, they discussed ipilimumab, uh, which they found that is not effective if you raise the natural gut bacteria with antibiotics, then ipilimumab will not work. But if you return it to the natural state, then ipilimumab will work. It's not only in um, therapeutics where gut microbiota are important, you could also see that in the pathogenesis, there's a direct effect in, in uh, the pathogenesis of uh, uh, etiology of cancer, and there are also indirect metabolic effects, which may be good or bad for the patient. 
Remember that the gut microbiota pre-processes all of your food, including your cancer chemotherapies that are oral. The, the mitochondria will try to process the xenobiotic first before transferring on to your body. So the upgrade in our information is that gut microbiota is now considered a postnatal organ. It is seeded at birth as the baby passes through the vaginal canal and then uh, it has a stable adult-like signature at one year of age. And at about two to three years of age, there's an increasing diversity of uh, the gut mitochondria, of the, of the gut bacteria. Um, what's notable here is there are now uh, increasing uh, studies showing that there is an increased incidence of um, immune diseases or immune dysfunction in children born by cesarean section because of the improper, um, improper um, activation of the uh, gut microbiota uh, because it doesn't pass through the birth canal. And if, I, I think all of you now know that the largest immune organ is no longer the hematopoietic uh, bone marrow system, but rather GALT, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, of which the gut microbiota are actually the ones essential in teaching self and non-self in the toll-like receptors of the intestines. In adults, the gut flora is the forgotten organ. It weighs about 2.2 kilos, and it functions as an organ. Uh, it functions as an organ within itself. We can measure the microbial profile in the stool now, and even better, we can also measure what your uh, bacteria are producing. For example, in your urine, high amounts of dihydroxyphenyl propionic acid would indicate um, uh, high co colonization of uh, of Clostridia species, and uh, that is usually present in autistic kids. So, continuing basic medical education is a new learning of basic medical information that was never taught to us in medical school. So, this is what I woke up with here in the Philippines last Saturday. It's from National Public Radio News. Uh, fighting cancer by putting tumors on cells on a diet. And the label of the picture is that foods that fit the ketogenic diet are high in fat and low in sugar. Actually, this is uh, four years late. The book that was, uh, this was based on was an unexpected bestseller in 2012, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. Now, this is based on the observation that many, but not all cancers, actually upregulate their uh, anaerobic respiration by using much of your body's sugar. So the goal is actually to remove glucose or carbohydrates in the diet and actually give medium chain fatty acids to, up, to upregulate the aerobic respiration and thereby starving the cancer cells. The phenomenon of upregulating the anaerobic respiration in cancer cells is called the Warburg hypothesis. Now, can we measure this? Yes, you can measure carbohydrates. X is anaerobic. You have lactic acid, pyruvic acid, and of course the ketone, beta-hydroxybutyric acid, and of course um, the energy metabolism. These are what? These are the metabolites of the Krebs cycle. Good for you, we can measure them now. Bad for you, you have to memorize them all over again. So what do we need to, what new uh, teaching should we have? we should have the bioenergetic etiology of disease. In medical school, this is what we learned. We learned the Darwinian paradigm of evolution, the anatomical paradigm of disease, the Mendelian paradigm of inheritance, but now we actually need to seriously consider adding the bioenergetic pers perspective on biology and medicine, learning about the bioenergetic paradigm of evolution, the bioenergetic paradigm of disease, and the Mendelian and mitochondrial paradigm of inheritance. I got um, disinterested in genetics when we could not explain something, they just said, oh, well, it's reduced penetrance. Well, actually, for example, uh, chloramphenicol resistance is conferred by mitochondrial DNA and not by nuclear, D nuclear DNA. Now, this uh, simply shows that that's why we started with the el electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, is that any oxphos, oxphos dysfunction that contributes to progressive bioenergetic decline can cause immunological disease, cancer, metabolic diseases, aging, and degenerative diseases. It's very simple to remember this. This is very complex. Just imagine a city with a blackout. If a city has blackout, you have no energy to what? Garbage collect, and therefore you think you cannot clean out your 
beta amyloid, right? And if you have no power also, you will not have any energy to regulate cell division and therefore you can have cancer. And if you don't have any, any energy, then you cannot fight off and defend yourself from infections and inflammations. Or an even simpler example is that all of you are tied to it, your cell phones. If you have no power, then you're practically fried. So um, this allows us to shift our attention away from somatic mutations in the nucleus and rather take a look at studies like this where tumor cells produce, normal cells produce normal cells, tumor cells produce tumor cells. Putting in a tumor nucleus in a normal cytoplasm will produce normal cells, but putting in a normal nucleus in a tumor cytoplasm will produce tumor cells. And that moves our attention away from the nucleus itself but, and into the cytoplasm and into the mitochondria. This is in the handout that was given to you. Uh, maybe we should look further ahead into the bioenergetic cause that can cause the genomic instability, that can cause the Warburg effect, and then give us all the cancer hallmarks of the disease of cancer. So we know that caloric restriction works. Overnight fasting may reduce breast cancer risk in women. We know that the ketogenic diet works. Um, I use it in my cancer patients myself, the effects of ketogenic diet, in, especially in improving the uh, quality of life in patients with uh, metastatic cancer. And my, con my own contribution to this is nutritional optimization. And what I'm saying here is that we should balance the reactive oxygen species. It's not enough to say that we should quell them totally or raise them high. We should measure them and put them into balance in order to give the healthy cells a fighting chance to fight for themselves and kill the cancer cells, and also enough of it such that no new cancer cells are produced. So continuing basic med medical education is a refresher, an update, an upgrade, and a new teaching in basic medical information that we did not learn from medical school. So that is continuing basic medical education. But what about health optimization medicine? This is a series in which this uh, lecture series is all about. There is no definition of health optimization medicine without defining what health is. If I ask you what health is, you probably wouldn't know how to define it for me. So please take home this definition with you. It's a very simple definition. Is health is equal to A plus B plus C. Health is an optimal physiologic state characterized by the absence of disease and the maintenance of B, the balance between anabolism and catabolism, according to C, the cycle of life of the organism. Now, how do we, now this means that just because you're not sick doesn't mean you're well, it only means that you're not sick. So we say, doctor, I'm healthy. No, are you healthy or are you just not sick? <clears throat> so fitness, however, it's another thing. It's an optimal physiologic state that allows one to handle stress from a baseline state according to the life cycle of an organism. So it means that being physically, emotionally, and mentally fit asks the question, fit for what? This means that I may be healthy but not fit to run a marathon, and you may be fit to run a marathon but you're not healthy. All right, so if health equals A plus B plus C, then A, the absence of disease, is illness medicine, and the maintenance of balance between anabolism and catabolism between this, according to the life cycle of the organism is health optimization medicine. In short, cancers belong to illness medicine, and uh, cancer prevention belongs to health optimization medicine. Um, Alzheimer's disease belongs to illness medicine, whereas Alzheimer's disease prevention belongs to health optimization medicine. So this is the health wrench to visualize this whole thing. It's a very easy, easier to understand so you don't confuse with other forms of medicine that you hear out there. So health is an optimal physiologic state characterized by the absence of disease. Then there's the practice of illness medicine. Illness medicine is practiced <clears throat> many ways. What we, what we know is actually allopathic medicine, which is the Western medicine that we all are trained in. Um, Alternative medicine is alternative approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Complementary medicine are complementary approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Integrative medicine is integrated approach to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. And functional medicine is functional approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. That is illness medicine. And um, B is the balance between uh, anabolic processes and catabolic processes, and maintaining that balance is actually 
uh, health optimization medicine. ELS medicine uses quantitative statistics. Health optimization medicine uses qualitative statistics. You guys in illness medicine use uh, evidence-based medicine or more appropriately called evidence-based illness medicine because you do have to prove that your drug works. We in health optimization medicine use what's called evidence-informed individualized care, which is wonderfully essayed in a July 27 editorial um, that shows the rise and fall of evidence medicine and the rise of person-centered clinical medicine. Even the United States last year has started its precision medicine initiative to uh, move away from a one-size-fits-all kind of treatment for the patients. So let's make this more concrete. How would you remember this thing? To remember this thing, it's very simple. What's the, what's the illness? The illness is either, okay, rickets in children or osteomalacia in adults. This is just from severe vitamin D deficiency, right? If a patient comes to you having this, you are very definitive. You say, yes, I know how to treat rickets in children, should be treated, blah, 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 you know that. And then, yes, nutritional uh, uh, osteomalacia should be treated, blah, blah, blah. But when we are told that healthy people need to add vitamin D, and vitamin D levels are uh, dependent on age, latitude, season, body mass index, skin color, and sun avoidance behavior. Then what the hell? We are so confused in our recommendations. Take a look. The recommended daily allowance of Institute of Medicine is only 600 IU per day. The upper limit of Institute of Medicine and uh, European Food Safety Agency is only 4,000. And the Endocrine Society says 10,000 IU for those who are at risk. Why are we all over the place? Because we are asking the wrong question. We are using a different paradigm. So in illness medicine, you ask, what's the risk? Here, you do not ask, Dr. Ted, what's the risk if I, if I don't take enough vitamin D? Rather, what vitamin D is optimal during a course of our evolution? And in the Maasai and the Hadza tribes, we know that their vitamin D levels are at 50 to 100 nanograms per ml, and cancer is virtually non-existent. So this is a major pillar that we use in health optimization medicine. It's clinical metabolomics. So what is the metabolome? The metabolome is the complete set of small molecule metabolites, such as metabolic intermediates, hormones, and other nutrient signaling molecules to be found within a biological sample. Here is its place in the pyramid. There's genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. Guys, metabolomics is already 20 years old. Now, this is the overall picture of what we do. We remember the interaction among three of the gears, the genetics. We should remember that the cells do not only contain nuclear DNA, they also contain mitochondrial DNA that are rapidly mutating. We, uh, there's the interaction with the symbiotic partners, the gut microbiota, and of course, mitochondria. Mitochondria are actually endosymbiotic bacteria that reside in inside your cells. And of course, the environment, that the exposome is what you call it, that signals uh, directly or indirectly via epigenetics and creates metabolic phenotypes. In other words, each of us has a metabolic phenotype, and we can measure the metabolome of that in order to detect the early onset of metabolic deregulations way before the onset of disease. And it's because the technology now allows us to take a look inside the cell and actually bring these types of technologies to the clinic. And then we can actually do appropriate health management and not illness medicine management. So this is just a simple example of epigenetics. If the food that you ate was rich in folic acid, for example, it might find itself in the methylation pathway, and it might find itself methylating the DNA. And methylation is one of those epigenetic pathways, epigenetic mechanisms that can shut off cancer genes. So the health optimization a framework to incorporate wellness in your clinical practice is actually very simple. You detect uh, the levels of hormones and nutrients and other elements of your metabolome. You detect their um, subtle toxicities and borderline deficiencies. You push them towards opt optimal levels before your patient gets sick. Or when your patient is sick, you try to optimize these levels anyway. Remember that you are not diagnosing any disease with home. You are detecting subtle toxicities and borderline deficiencies in the metabolomic network, then balancing them to optimal levels. Remember, the key word here is network. If you touch one node in the network, other nodes will move. And just as a warning to you, for example, if you're going to 
uh, to fiddle around with cortisol levels, you better start fiddling around with the thyroid hormone and the growth hormone as well. Now, your, parent, your patients, as I said, are not very sharp. They read a lot of things like this, right? So they say, doctor, why, how did what I eat in high school affect my current breast cancer risk level? Well, I don't know how to answer this. That's why I brought in Dr. Gianluca Pazzaglia to hopefully help us answer this question. I met Gianluca at a pro-aging conference in Europe three years ago, and he was the very last lecturer in, uh, in the Congress, and you could imagine that hairy that gets right with everyone wanting to leave. But um, uh, he stayed on because his, the lecture was on cancer and nutrients, and we went to a bar afterwards, and we had a drink of sparkling water. Imagine an Italian that doesn't drink wine. Um, Dr. Pazzaglia is a sinologist, and for oncologists here, you all know that a what a sinologist is, but for mere mortals like me, I had to look up sinology. Sinology is a medical specialty focused on the complex area of breast diseases, their diagnosis, treatments, and rehabilitation. It's aimed at judging risks emerging from the medical history of a patient and at selecting the right imaging or examination method which will lead to early diagnosis and treatment of pathological formations of the breast. So he's a breast man. The Synologist, uh, this is an article in the 2000, 2005 journal, says the Synologist is not only a surgeon who operates on the breast, he is also a clinician, a researcher, and a philosopher and that Europe at the time was going to set up independent breast units because it's the only way to offer excellent services. Um, Gianluca graduated from the University of Perugia in Italy, and if you have eaten Bacci Perugina chocolates, then you have had a taste of the product of Perugia. His specialty is diagnostic imaging, and he was happy to meet me because I was an interventional neuroradiologist in another life. Um, his experience and publications are in early diagnosis and prevention of breast cancer, and he's been doing this for two decades. He's a director of the Breast Unit or Breasting Center of Perugia, specializing in uh, early diagnosis. He is the co-founder of Artois, sorry, he corrected me, Artois, pardon the French, an association for the research of integrated oncology therapies. And he's a member of the faculty of KIA-T, and he is my colleague at the World Society of Anti-Aging Medicine, for which he is the Italian delegate. His first book was co-written with Fabrizio Durante, uh, Forever Young. And then the book that he's most known for is the big book on anti-cancer therapies. And his newest book is Diet and Hormones in Breast Diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome and present Dr. Gianluca Pazzaglia. Okay, good evening. My first lecture is Breakfast at Cancers. Ipse Dixit was used first time by Cicerone in De Natura Deorum, speaking about Pythagora. Next, Ipse Dixit was used by Averroe, speaking about Aristotele, because the knowledge of Aristotle is like Koran. It's impossible to put in discussion. <laughs> Fortunately, during my education, I have met two professors that pushed me to think different. One of these was a young medical student in the early 50s. He was going to the lessons of internal medicine, and the professor says, during abdominal fever, you have a piece purea diarrhea, green. But the medical doctor, the young medical student, not doctor, going to the hospital, look at the diarrhea of the patient, but it is totally different, yellow. So he looked to the text, but again inside the text, is written, Pis Purea Diarrhea. So it came by edition by edition until the first edition 
always green diarrhea. But the first edition is the translation of a German text. And he was knowing the German. Imagine at that time, the 50s, the medical literature was by German, not by USA. So he brought the German test and solved the mystery. In German language, P is written Erbsen, but in the text was written Kicker Erbsen, that is chickpeas. The translator did a mistake, and so all the doctors go on the same direction. Incredible. Today, I spoke to you about fantasy oncology. Not true, but sometimes also a story may be true. I have worked for 27 years. I founded the Breast and Cancer Center, written some books. The last is this, but since the beginning of my job, I had in my, in my mind many questions. Why we have no true rules to work out breast lesion without invasive procedures like fine needle aspiration? In fact, if you look at this nodule, it has the 93% probability to be breast cancer, not 100%, but it's irregular, like cancer. And this round, oval, smooth, regular, black, 0% to be breast cancer. Oh, it's OK. But this regular, smooth, oval, round, but hypoechoic, 2% to be a cancer. Oh, no problem. I have one lesion. I perform fine needle aspiration. But uh, when we have many lesions, like in this case, I have a patient with uh, 1,000 of this lesion. It's impossible to do fine needle aspiration for all. The problem is big. And uh, why don't we do anything to reduce the numbers of breast lesion? Because it's easier. Why don't we do true prevention. Not only, we discover more and more breast lesion and consequently more radiotherapy, more surgery, more chemotherapy, but uh, which kind of prevention is this? I imagine prevention is equal to less cancer, not equal to more cancer. It's the opposite. Why do we use hormones, for example, at menopause that may increase the number of breast lesions. The opposite. And why, when this woman in HRT, from, by the gynecologist, develops a cancer, come the oncologist that uh, not only put away the HRT, but suppress with aromatase inhibitors their own residual hormonal production. But, uh, who is right? Gynecologist, oncologist, before one, after the other? It's impossible, both. Maybe the truth is in half. At the same time, I worked very hard, uh, junk food, no exercise, uh, job stress. I developed many illnesses. Anxiety, depression, colitis, uh, neurodermatitis, phlebitis, and so on, many, many uh, illness. And uh, the specialist uh, consulted by me gave to me cortisone. With cortisone, some symptoms disappear. But after three days, three, four days, I met one of my professors. He said immediately, you are fatter, more older, and ugly. So I came to home and I put cortisone in the dust, and say to myself, I resolve my problem by myself. And with this thinking, I began my journey into complementary medicine. And quickly, I came to this sentence. We develop illness when we become old. More age, more ill. So, if we slow the aging progress, 
maybe we may reduce the probability of illness. And this is primary prevention. So why do we age? There are many theories. The most valuable is the endocrine theory, the endocrine senescence theory. For which theory we become old when the endocrine glands produce less and less hormones. And for this theory, the gynecologist uses a high hormonal approach, a high grade hormonal approach, and the oncologist a minimal, a minimal. But probably we develop illness when hormones are high and when are low and when are not balanced. So if we have the right dose of hormones and the right balance, probably we age less and we develop less disease. So the rate of aging is in endocrine. But with age, many hormones are declining, except insulin. Insulin increase. Insulin is stimulated by carbohydrates, a little less by proteins, almost never by fats. But why we have conflicting information about food? One year they say to us that meat is okay, the year after meat is bad. Why? Because in nutrition it's impossible to do randomized, double-blind, control clinical trials, but only observational studies like this. These studies evaluate an association, not cause to effect. And the association may be casual, like wearing a yellow clothes increase the number of colon cancer or causal association. For example, eating meat increases the number or the risk of colon cancer, but also inverse causal association. The colon cancer uh, illness increase the need or the desire to eat meat. So, in which way do we evaluate association through absolute risk and through relative risk. The absolute risk in exposed people, that is the people that eat more meat, is indicated with A, and is the ratio between new cases of disease on number of persons exposed. And the absolute risk in not exposed people is indicated with B, new cases of the disease on number of not exposed persons. The relative risk is the ratio between A and B, like this. If the relative risk is more than the unit, we have the, a positive association. To find a surrogate of the cause effect, Bradford Hill in 1965 developed some parameters, the most important of which is the strength of association. If relative risk is inferior to 1.5 to 2, the, the association is weak. Very important also is the confidence interval at 95%. If relative risk contains the unit is not statistically significant, like in this uh, situation. The red meat case. The World Cancer Research found right red meat increase colon retum cancer risk. And they write this, studying this 70 research. But looking inside, we see that the relative risk is inferior to 1.5. That is weak. Not only 
but the relative, the relative risk is between 0.9 to 1.5. That is not statistically significant. Look at smoke, smoke and lung cancer between 8 and 25. Huge. That is statistically significant. So, may we say meat is dangerous? No. May we say meat is not dangerous? No. Not only, but we may have confounding factors. For example, the people that eat more meat may consume less fruit and vegetables, may be obese, may smoke, and all the factors may increase the colon cancer risk. For this study, the EPIC, the, veg the vegetarian, imagine, the vegetarians have more colon cancer risk. So, the fat, animal fat hypothesis, same problem, not statistically significant. And what about fruit and vegetables? We are sure about it, about them. No, because the possible role is weakened with the last study. And about the China study? is another study of association with the same problem. So, finally, with Alexander, we say, despite the numerous scientific advancement, there is no conclusive evidence regarding specific roles for food groups and individual foods in cancer causation. Stop. So, conclusion, we have any conclusion. also for vegetarian, omnivorous, vegans, and so on. Think different. Again, if it's impossible to know what people with less cancer risk eat, we may change the question and ask, what does a cancer eat? Mainly in laboratory. Cancer eats glucose and glutamine. And we see this in PET scan when we inject radioactive glucose to look to cancer cells. Life is a fight for energy. And in which way a cancer cell may compete with trillions of normal cells? In unicellular organism, when the nutrients are available, they proliferate. But in multicellular organism, the link between nutrients and growth is mediated by growth factors. And insulin is a growth factor. And uh, is it stimulated, we just know, by mainly carbohydrates. Insulin pushes nutrients inside the cells. Growth factor, like insulin, link to cellular receptors, like a key into a keyhole. These receptors are located on the surface the, of the cell's superficial receptor. Inside this group, of interest for us are the receptors with enzymatic activity, mainly the tyrosine kinesis receptors. They are a transmembrane protein with an extracellular domain and with an intracellular domain. When the ligand links to extracellular domain, we have an, an homodimerization and then the activation of the intracellular domain. The signal goes into the nucleus, activates the DNA, and finally will the cell produce proteins. This is the epigenetic link. So, the tyrosine kinases produce many substances. The most important pathway is this, the pathway of phosphatidylinositol free kinase produ that produces phosphatidylinositol free phosphate. This activates A-kappa-T, and the A-kappa-T stimulates the growth of the cells, the proliferation. 
not only, but AKT stimulates mTOR, and mTOR again stimulates pro proliferation. Not only, but mTOR stimulates epoxy induced factor 1, and epoxy induced factor 1 promotes an angiogenesis and, very important, glycolysis. In fact, this pathway regulates glucose uptake and utilization to the glucose transported and, most important, in the first step of glycolysis, that is on the exokinase enzyme. But mTOR inhibits FOXP3 also, and FOXP3 is very important because it stimulates the number of Treg cells. Less FOXP3, less Treg, more inflammation. Not only, but AKT t stimulates NF-kappa-beta, NF-kappa-beta inside the nucleus stimulates again inflammation. So finally, this pathway stimulates proliferation, inflammation, angiogenesis and glycolysis. That, t, that is the neoplastic tetrade. In opposition, there is another pathway, the MP kinesis. This increases catabolism and reduces the anabolism. Quite the opposite. Inhibits phosphofructokinase, reduces cholesterol, triglyceride, reduces glycemia, reduces inflammation, reduces chronic disease, increase very important autophagy, mainly the autophagy of mitochondria with mitochondrial biogenesis and uh, increase, globally, longevity. The two pathways inhibit each other. The first is stimulated mainly by carbohydrates, and the second mainly by fats. This is the global skin, and we need a balance between the two pathway. Instead, today, we have pushed on this. Look to the metabolism of normal cells, for example, glucose go through the glycolysis with production of 2 ATP, then into Krebs cycle, again 2 ATP, and then to oxidative phosphorylation with a huge amount of ATP, 36 molecules. The glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm and Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation inside mitochondria. In cancer cells, the metabolism stops here to produce lactic acid. This, this uh, problem was shown first time da, ba, uh, by the uh, Nobel uh, uh, Otto Warburg. In fact, for Otto Warburg, Cancer was an energy problem. He was studying Sia Urkin. But even if cancer cells exhibited the same kind of explosive growth like C. Urkin, cancer cells didn't fuel it through increased respiration. No. But they fermented the glucose, that is glycolysis, also in presence of oxygen. So cancer cells produce the energy in a different way. Barburg showed also that if there is a reduction of 35% of oxygen to the cells, the cells become cancerous. And uh, the tumor type benign or malignant is dependent on the duration of the epoxia. If the epoxia takes only some hours, the develop is cancer malignant cells. This is the induction of cancer through epoxia, but we have seen also the induction of cancer in normoxia through AKT mTOR pathway. So we have two systems to induce cancer. But why do cancer cells use such 
inefficient system in which, uh, this, that is the Warbur effect, in which one molecule of glucose produces only two molecules of ATP for two reasons. First one, to produce lactic acids, because lactic acids destroy the normal sand surrounding, promoting invasion. Incidentally, is glycolysis to increase acidosis, that is cancer to increase acidosis, not the opposite. The second reason is cancer needs building materials. Imagine, if you have uh, a wood pile and you bar all, it's impossible to build homes. And if you build only homes, you haven't fire. So the cancer uses some glucose to produce energy and much more to produce new cancer cells. In this view, the genetic damage support can first Warburg effect. Do you remember Dolly Sheep, the clone? At that time, we developed with uh, Bill Clinton, the president of USA, the Human Genome Project. And somebody asked if it could be possible to sequence the genomes of cancer cells. And finally, in uh, 2005, we had the Cancer Genome Atlas by Bert Vogestein. Bert Vogestein shown that we have two kinds of DNA mutation. Driver, they originate the cancer, and passengers, they are only passengers. They are accompanying the drivers. Not in, they are not important. This is fundamental, this is not. Bert Vogestein was fascinated by the work, by the job of uh, Georgi Papanicolaou, the pap test. In the pap test, uh, Georgi Papanicolaou showed that uh, you have, step by step, a progression from normal cells to cancer with uh, a big order. Bert Vogestein thought we may have also an order in genetic mutation that support the clinical, the cellular mutation. That is, the cancer is uh, a chaotic growth, but inside the cells, the DNA mutation are in order, step by step. And he developed uh, this theory on colon cancer. But in 2013, the sequencing data on more than 21,000 genes from 100 breast cancer samples, imagine, showed in 28 ca cases only one single driver mutation. One mutation for a cancer for a multi-step progression cancer. Very difficult to imagine, but astonishing. In five samples, no driver mutation at all. So if cancer is a pathology, a disease of DNA mutation, why we have five cancer without mutations? It's impossible. In fact, the mortality for cancer in USA from 50s to today is this line. That is, is reduced only 8%. Look, 67% in heart disease, 77 reduction of mortality in cerebrovascular disease. And cancer, the war against cancer, only 8%. Nothing. Not only, but this reduction is only for men when they have stopped to smoke. Nothing. So, which origin may we imagine? May we think different? A metabolic origin of a cancer? 
In this case, metabolic damage came first, and genetic damage follows. It's totally different, an opposite paradigm. In this case, cancer is one singular disease of metabolism. Warburg stated, there are many remote causes of cancer, X-rays, car uh, chemical carcinogens, but only one common cause, the block of mitochondrial respiration. In fact, chemical carcinogens, X-rays, and viruses damage nuclei, but also mitochondria. Look at this experiment just showed, in which if you put cancer nucleus inside normal sense, you have uh, normal daughter cells. And if you put normal nucleus inside the cancer cells, the daughter cells are cancerous. But they go further. If you put inside the normal cells mito tumoral mitochondria, the daughter cells are neoplastic. And if you put inside cancer cells, normal mitochondria, the daughter cells are normal. It's very clear. In fact, in cancer, you have mitochondria with less criste and very puffy. But now, how did injured, my, damaged mitochondria lead to in control proliferation? The most obvious possibility is the epigenetic signaling. In fact, an epigenetic signal comes from mitochondria to DNA because mitochondria talk with DNA, with nuclear DNA. And this is called retrograde response of mitochondria to nucleus. And imagine the response, retrograde response activate again A kappa T and TOR. It's logical. So, in this case, the signal from mitochondria is chronically on. And so, in this theory, the retrograde response comes first, and the genetic damage follows. But finally, what do cancer eat? Does cancer eat? Glucose, mainly in glucose, and glutamine. Maybe the restriction of this nutrient, uh, an anti-cancer strategy? In this experiment, there were two groups of uh, mice where restrict the calories, and one group were fed with high-carbohydrate diet, restrict high-carbohydrate diet, and the other one with restrict high-fat diet. In, and this is the uh, macronutrient ratio. In both cases, we have a reduction of the cancer. So the reduction of the cancer is uh, more depending uh, from energy content of the diet restricted than by diet nutrient composition. So there isn't only one strategy to fight cancer. The fight between omnivorous vegetarians and the others is unuseful because we have many strategies. But caloric restriction is needed to reduce glycemia because hyperglycemia is correlated with poor prognosis. But maintaining caloric restriction and reducing at the same time or eliminating carbohydrates may increase the metabolic pressure on cancer cell because in this case the body produces ketone bodies and ketone bodies may be used only by mitochondria but cancer cells have damaged mitochondria so normal cells may use ketone body cancer cells not not only, but the metabolic ratio, the basal metabolic ratio um, of uh, uh, mouse 
is sevenfold greater than humans. So to obtain the same result, obtaining in the group of mice with a strict high um, glycemic, high carbohydrate diets, in the, transporting this in the human, we, we must reduce the caloric intake to only 500 calories or to perform the fasting. Alternately, instead, if uh, we use the ketogenic diet, the reduction of calories is less impressive. But you must uh, restrict in the ketogenic diet the calories because instead the blood glycemia remain high and the ketone body are excreted by urine. In, instead, in restricted ketogenic diet, the glycemia go down and ketone bodies are used by the cells. In this scheme, you see the difference between ketogenic diet and diabetic ketoacidosis. The quantity of ketones in diabetic ketoacidosis are higher than ketosis, but more, more important, the glycemia is high in diabetic ketoacidosis and very low in ketosis. This is a global difference. In fact, this is ketosis, and here, this ketoacidosis, the opposite. And uh, what about protein? Colin Campbell, in China study, performed this uh, experiment. He put two group of mice, one fed with casein 5%, and the other one 20%. In the first six months, if he gave to the mice also aflatoxin to induce hepatic cancer and then observed the uh, mouse destiny for one year and a half. Finally, after two years, the first group, casein 5%, all were alive. In the other group, all dead. But not shown in the book, there is another study from Campbell after the period of aflatoxin induction, he divided the two groups in other two groups. And finally, he had one group fed with 5% casein during aflatoxin and 5% during one year and a half after. The second group, 520, the third group, 25, and the fourth, 2020. Look at this, 25. So, if you have more protein during the induction phase, they are protective. But when the cancer is established, the protein increase the cancer. But it's normal. So the proteins is good or bad depending from the phase. And generally, it's better to stay at about 10% calories per day from protein. That is about 20 to 30 grams per meal of proteins, because after they stimulate through the insulinemic index, insulin. But reducing uh, glycemia, you reduce also IGF-1. So you have both the uh, results. Finally, in 2007, Time wrote, can a high-fat diet beat cancer? In fact, the reduced glucose reduce through the low glycemia, proliferation, invasion, angiogenesis, and inflammation. And obviously, brain cancer is the best candidate because it's fed only by glucose, generally speaking. And in PubMed, we have many, many cases but I show you, maybe, ah, this case with glioblastoma. 
with the total disappearance of the cancer with ketogenic diet. Very impressive. You may find this information in uh, this my website where you may find also this book. This is only a story, remember, and this is my first lecture with mitochondrial optimization and nutrients for cancer prevention. When the mitochondrial has damaged in mitochondrial dysfunction, we have less ATP production, more inflammation, more damage by infectious agents, more free radicals, less secretion of insulin with the consequence, more TL per 17 and less Treg, immune dysregulation, and in case of excess of apoptosis, we may have Alzheimer. In failure of apoptosis, cancer and IT immunity. What is the answer of mitochondria? Fusion, the binding of two mitochondria into one large mitochondria. The reallocation, that is the recycling of the part, the component to discard the bad stuff and keep the good parts of the two mitochondria. Then, the fission, that is the splitting of the large mitochondria into uh, the outer mitochondria. And in 10% of the case, one mitochondria bring the bad stuff and so go to mitophagy. In fact, mitophagy may be following the fusion fission cycle or directly. If we have mitophagy excess, we have less ATP, and if mitophagy is insufficient, we have more oxidative stress, more free radicals, and more inflammation. So, so mitophagy uh, must be in the middle. We have also mitochondrial biogenesis, de novo. And, most important, the mitochondrial transmembrane potential, essential for producing ATP. Also, this uh, potential must be in the middle. In fact, in case of insufficient transmembrane potential, like uh, in uh, case of leaky mitochondria, we have a reduction of, produced, or of ATP produced and more free radicals. But more important is the opposite, excess transmembrane potential, that is mitochondrial hyperpolarization. In this case, the electron transport chain shut down and mitochondria hibernates. That is the mitochondrial burnout. In this case, you have the uncoupling of electron and ATP. So you have less ATP, more free radicals, and remember that mitochondria are the main source of free radicals which radicals again activates mTOR, A-kappa-T mTOR, always the same pathway. In fact, mTOR1 and 2 stay very close to mitochondria to bring the information by the mitochondria itself. So, with the activation of mTOR, we have the shift to glycolysis, and this is the explanation of the Warburg effect of the other slides, promotes inflammation, proliferation, and inhibits apoptosis, just seen before. So, what, we, what we may do to, for mitochondrial optimization? First one, we may induce mitophagy. Second, mitochondrial stimulation. Third, therapeutic disinhibition from toxins. First one, mitophagy is very important, but for reduce the number of dysfunctional mitochondria, but uh, not too much because uh, instead we have uh, too less mitochondria. So in this case, carbohydrate restriction or the this ketogenic diet is very important because the overfuel, overload of carbohydrates induce 
the mitochondrial hyperpolarization, that is the mitochondria burnout. So if we reduce carbohydrates, we, we remove the mitochondrial hyperpolarization and we induce mitophagy and also ketogenesis. And so carbohydrate intakes should be minimal, but otherwise sufficient. There is a balance because carbohydrates are necessary for glycogen stores and production of tryptophan. So I promote or a ketogenic diet with many vegetables in which the quantitative of uh, carbohydrates per day is inferior uh, to 50 grams, or a supplemented paleo-mediterranean diet in which the carbohydrates are between 50 to 100 grams per day, or cycling between them. And the proteins in sedentary people is one gram per kilogram per day. This Ayurvedic pro uh, proverb is, is very important because when the diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And when the diet is correct, medicine is of no need. The second strategy is exercise because exercise improves the nutrient and the oxygen delivery to the cells increase uh, alkalosis with retaining of magnesium, promotes mitophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis. Second strategy, mitophagy supplementation and stimulation. Pay attention because if you stimulate dysfunctional mitochondria, you have more dysfunction. So it's better before to reestablish the health of mitochondria. First one, multivitamins and multimineral supplementation. Also Harvard says to us that it's very important to give vitamins to people to avoid the risk of chronic disease. And there are so many studies supporting the same idea. But when you interview the oncologist, 70% says pay attention, 21% says no, and the others, yes, yes, or are neutral. This is, is due to this study in which is, uh, uh, is shown a possible interference between antioxidant and pro-oxidative action of chemotherapy. But many patients after chemotherapy have vitamin deficiency. In this study, in, we, in uh, children, the children that have more antioxidant in the serum haven't uh, any reduction of chemotherapy schedule, less infection, and less days of hospitalization. And in this study, the same was shown for radiotherapy. So it's important to give the right dose of antioxidant at the right time. For example, uh, we use antioxidant by infusion after three days from chemotherapy, when the pro-oxidative action of chemotherapy is disappeared. Okay? Not only, but there are some people with metabolic impairment due to SNPs that need higher doses of my multivitamins. For example, vitamin C. Linus Pauling in 1970 showed to us that patient, uh, the use of vitamin C in patients with advancing cancer increased the survival three, four times more. And in this study, Vitamin C reduces the risk of stomach cancer. But in breast cancer, if you use vitamin C rich food, you reduce the risk. If you use vitamin C supplement, you may increase, like in these studies. But in fact, vitamin C has an effect only in combination with food. But the protective effect may be due 
of other factors associated with the consumption of vitamin C. And in JAMA, the review of 68 studies showed no effect on survival. But this study has shown that only with injection, with intravenous injection of vitamin C, you have the amount, the serum amount of vit vitamin C that may have uh, an anti-cancer activity. So, the efficacy of vitamin C treatment can be evaluated from clinical trials that use only oral dosing, okay? In fact, we need randomized trials. They are coming soon with or without chemotherapy. In the meantime, you may use one to four grams per day of vitamin C. And about carotenoids, the results are mixed. You may see in this study. And about uh, vitamin A, in this study, again, you have a risk, a reduction of risk of stomach cancer. But about breast cancer, some, stu some studies show the reduction of risk. Some others, the increase of risk. Not only, but beta-carotene increase prostate cancer in male smokers. And also in the study, ATBC and carrot, beta-carotene plus vitamin A in smokers increase lung cancer and mortality for all causes. Uh, the same data in this uh, study. And uh, again, for JAMA, no reduction on survival. So, in the meantime, if you want to use vitamin A, it's better in uh, the long treatment not uh, exceed the 25,000 international unit because instead you may have liver damage. And uh, about vitamin D is the more prevalent uh, deficiency in the population. Vitamin D blocks cell cycle, downregulates the receptors for growth factor, induce apoptosis, inhibits angiogenesis, invasion, and metastasis, and cancer, but cancer, absorb very few vitamin D and at the same time have, has an increased catabolism on vitamin D. However, Vitamin D, it's impossible to read, okay. Vitamin D reduces the risk of cancer-like prostate, but not skin, and also the digestive system cancer. But the reduction of serum level of vitamin D induced by the use of calcium may explain why the use of milk may be uh, may increase the risk of prostate cancer. And what about vitamin D and breast cancer? Vitamin D inhibits estrogen proliferation, and there is an inverse association between premenopausal breast cancer and vitamin D, like in this study. Vitamin D has many anti-cancer effects, but very important is the fact that uh, vitamin D receptor negative breast cancer uh, relapse earlier. And, interesting, estrogens upregulate the vitamin D receptor and the estrogens quite the opposite, like tamoxifen. Not only, but uh, vitamin D promotes a balance between Treg and TL70, reducing inflammation. Finally, this randomized study of 2007 showed very well that using 2,000 international units per day of vitamin D, you have a decrease of 77% of all cancer. So, like Dr. Ted said, use vitamin D. About the dose may be possible in adults to use uh, until 4,000 international units, and for adult adults, it's better to use 10,000, because they 
uh, answer and respond quicker and better. But pay attention mainly on sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, and lymphoma. And uh, look at the level of vitamin D in the serum and also the level of calcium. The optimal range for vitamin D in the serum is between 50 and 100 nanogram milliliter. Introduce also a balanced and complete fatty acid supplementation, like this, because if you use only one, you may create imbalance in the other. In fact, if you use only fish oil, you create a deficiency of gamma-linolenic acid. And if you use gamma-linolenic acid alone, you reduce eicosapentaenoic acid and increase arachidonic acid, like in this study. But gamma-linolenic acid is necessary to produce anti-inflammatory prostaglandins and arachidonic acid to produce prostacycline, like in this scheme. Not only, but alpha-linolenic acids increase lightly eicosapentaenoic acid, no incre increase in docosahexanoic, and reduction of oleic acids. How many membranes, uh, oxygen, must pass to go into the mitochondria? Then, um, seven membranes. In which way oxygen may pass these barriers? Through the fatty acids double bound, linking to the double bound. And we see that fish oil and arachidonic acids have more double bound, so it's better. Not ever. If we have too much double bounds, the membrane becomes rancid at our uh, Celsius, 37 Celsius degree. In fact, fish oil are the anti-freezing oil for fish of cold and deep sea, not for us. In fact, this study, select study, has shown that uh, patient people with higher level, serum level of omega-3 have an increase of prostate cancer risk. So maybe it's better to use primitive essential oil, like alpha-linolenic and linolenic acids. And this is the distribution, in fact, of this uh, PIOS in the membrane and the serum. In fact, normally, the conversion of primitive essential oil in our body is little. And no, is, it isn't a problem like Barry Sears says. It's safe because instead we may have rancid membrane. In fact, the use of linolenic acid doesn't increase arachidonic acid, and no evidence exists to su support the proposition that unulter unadulterated, that is, virgin form of linolenic acid is pro-inflammatory. Quite the opposite. In fact, in this case, we have a reduction of cardiovascular disease risk. The, about the microbioma, Dr. Ted said uh, almost all, and uh, to um, feed the good bacteria, use uh, prebiotics, fermented food, and you may introduce also probiotics. And to fight the harmful bacteria, you may use some herbal extract, like oregano oil and Artemisia annua. Take iodine, very important, because uh, Iodine deficiency is wi widespread because iodine in salt is poor available and now we use very poor quantity of salt for hypertension. But in people in which the intake of iodine is higher, like in Japan, we have less breast cancer. Not only, but Japanese women that went to USA 30 years ago have more breast cancer like 
the USA woman. Dr. Wright, in 2002, studying the, uh, the assumption of seaweed in the Japan, calculated that the average intake of Japan uh, about iodine is 13.8 milligram per day, a huge amount confirmed by this uh, study and indirectly confirmed by this other in which were used 100 milligram per day uh, of iodine in diabetes and up to 6 gram per day in pioderma gangrenosum and uh, in sporotrichosis using the antimicrobial effect of iodine without any drug resistance. So you may use iodine also for this. These are the need of uh, iodine by thyroid and this by breast, quite the same. And uh, when we have iodine deficiency, thyroid and breast fight for iodine. When we have a quantity of uh, iodine at least 100 times uh, RDA, iodine bind to lipids to make delta iodolactones in this way. And they are very important for apoptosis and cellular proliferation. In fact, the most important in cancer property of iodine is proapoptotic effect. And also, uh, iodine is useful for balancing the estrogens toward the estriol, the, the weak estrogen, improving the estrogen metabolization. And iodine is also fundamental for adrenal, very important for adrenal. During uh, iodine deficiency, the normal cells of the breast mutate toward typical hyperplasia and then to atypical hyperplasia. In fact, in this study, using milligram amounts of iodine, you have a decrease of fibrocystic disease, confirmed by this other study. Not only, but in case of uh, hypothyroidism, we have more breast cancer and progesterone increase the uptake of iodine. So following the advices of Dr. Wright to use uh, iodine in milligram amounts, many clinicians followed him using a uh, huge amount of iodine, generally with uh, good effects and without general.